Right, so we're starting notes number 15 now on elastic borne inversion. And what I'll do when I finish this is I'll go into a case history of the imaging the Hikarangi subduction zone using multi -com component data and multi component migration. Uh, of course, elastic, and that'll be based on this uh, elastic borne inversion uh, set of concepts. Uh, so that's uh, uh, not a PDF. Uh, uh, it's on the website. So um, uh, if we get that far today, uh, hopefully it won't be too much trouble to bring that up. And in any case, uh, I'm sure I'll still be into it uh, for tomorrow's lecture. <coughs> so <clears throat> we have um, uh, looked at uh, uh, the wave equation in this in a certain way, where um, uh, we have uh, this operator L, which operates on the data, um, and um, this is the, uh, the the acoustic pressure field P, and that is equal to a source term, which is uh, delta um, a delta function, uh, which is delay or advanced by the um, uh, the imaging condition. You can see I you can see I put in there delta r. You know that's the distance uh, uh, from the uh, the source to the reflector, uh, and then times uh, a source wavelength. Okay. So um, uh, we are calling this uh, wave operator G. Okay, that is. As it turns out, this this L here, this L operator, that's really the the wave equation, and we've seen it as the acoustic wave equation. We've looked at it as the DSR equation in the Fourier domain, Fourier spatial domain, and uh, omega domain. Um, so uh, there are cases where we can write this out, this this L out, and the G just to let you know is minus L inverse. Okay. That's how we, we think of G. Now, the Born approximation begins with the lippmann schwinger equation, which says that G is G0, which is a direct wave. Um, and, and we're approximating that direct travel via uh, uh, ray equations. Okay, So we're tracing rays and using simple concepts like, um, like uh, 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 geometric uh, spreading. Okay, so uh, the uh, the the Green's function for our uh, for all of our our data, our seismic data, are a direct wave plus g zero v g, and v is uh, you know g zero v g is is a uh, a Feynman diagram. So we're getting a full wave field. Okay, that's g there, not g naught. Uh, and we're interacting it with the scattering potential v within our our volume of reflectors, and then we we can go from the scattering potential to the receiver with a g naught with a direct a direct wave. So our Born approximation of the Lippmann Schwinger equation is just to take the first two terms, right? You again substitute this whole g in for g here, and you get more terms, and and they end in g. Uh, not g naught, and so you make the substitution again, and recursively that way you can generate as many terms as you want. And what do those extra terms look like? The ones that we're not using in the Born approximation down here, those are multiple reflections, multiple interactions. And in fact, when you add up all of those multiple reflections, you're going to get things like surface waves, right? So the Lippmann Schwinger equation is rather difficult to use. You have to use it as its full, you know, infinite series. Uh, just to just to look at surface waves, so there's easier ways to uh, to look at surface waves. But um, if we're interested in the direct waves and just the primary reflections, the ones that have only interacted once with the uh, reflecting medium, then um, we can use this Born approximation, which is very easy. Okay. So the uh, uh, the uh, um, and then ignoring uh, further the direct waves, and 
and talking about the reflection data d sub r, that's uh, uh, a source wavelet, uh, then transmitted to the uh, from the source to the reflector, um, multiplied by the uh, the reflectivity potential v as a function of uh, of r, you know where you are within the volume. Um, and then another uh, transmission back up to the receiver, all right. And for uh, uh, constant uh, uh, reference uh, density, constant reference um, incompressibility, um, you know we have uh, model parameter, media par medium parameter a one, which is delta k over k, uh, and of course delta k is much much less than k, and a two, which is delta rho over rho, and same thing. Delta rho is much much less than, than rho, so those are the asymptotic media parameters. Um, the reflection data then in the Fourier domain become uh, uh, basically this simple. Um, you know, there's a uh, uh, a rho naught over four, and then uh, uh, this uh, geometric spreading. No, I'm sorry, this. Uh, uh, well, this this factor here, a one, capital A one, uh, is uh, involves the uh, uh, the full uh, DSR, okay, and geometric spreading, and that's multiplied by little a one, which is the medium parameter, um, and then uh, a two, similar thing uh, applied to um, to uh, uh, the uh, the density uh, perturbations, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, for example, a one is this uh, uh, you know combination of ray parameters uh, under um, um, under our uh, our uh, our simplification. You know, going directly from L capital L being the uh, uh, the acoustic wave equation, okay, in the Fourier domain, and we've you've seen how to do you know convert uh, wave equations into the Fourier domain before. Uh, it does involve kz, and what is kz? Uh, you know the other things, uh, km, kh. We know how to get those out of the data, out of our reflection data. That's fine, okay. Um, but how do we get kz? Well, that's just uh, downward continuation with the double square root equation, which of course depends on ks, kg, and omega. Um, so uh, the fk inversion <coughs> is. Um, you know, we, we saw that for uh, um, a uh, a field of uh, where we're uh, you know looking at how how things vary in uh, at a constant value of ks and a constant value of kg or constant value of km and constant value of k uh, of um, of uh, let's see there's k and kz and then um, uh, we can uh, look at we can stack it or or look at the variation of the Fourier transform data with uh, Fourier transformed and stretched data stretched according to DSR um, according to um, uh, we can look at that the variation of that those complex quantities uh, against KH right and uh, doing some uh, uh, some estimation there. Um, we can get our a1 and a2 fields in m and z, okay, with m and z axes, which is of course what we want, you know. And again, trying to separate the apparent, the attempt here is to use that amplitude versus offset information to try to separate the uh, incompressibility field, the incompressibility section from the density uh, perturbation section, okay. Then we uh, uh, we looked at um, uh, far field, and, and instead of keeping everything in the uh, in the ray in the Fourier domain, we um, we kept it in the physical domain. And what that basically gave us was a, a kind of Kirchhoff migration. All right, and we had to see how to um, uh, how to come up with uh, uh, with uh, is, uh, you know if this was B here, the Born operator, uh, we had to come up with with B transpose. And so that was uh, a little bit of uh, work with definitions of inner products. Okay, and using an inner product theory. So now um, 
you know, that was all developed for the, uh, the acoustic wave equation. What about the elastic wave equation? Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. You said if we took all the terms, the infinite terms of the Lipman Schwinger, yeah. we could get surface waves? Right, right. How are we getting surface waves when there's not even a no shear modulus term? Oh, uh, there's a kind of surface wave. It's related to uh, tube waves um, uh, in, 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 in acoustic media. You know, if you meet certain conditions like having a low velocity channel to surface, you can, you can still get a, uh, uh, a thing that's like a surface wave. Um, but we're not talking like Rayleigh. Well, no, no. I mean, not until the elastic, right? So in the acoustic world, um, even in marine data, uh, like uh, where you have uh, a shallow, you know, shallow mud, and you know you're shooting a, a multi-offset uh, reflection survey uh, in a marine environment, but it's a shallow marine environment. You've got mud, and then you've got a hard bottom. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, one place to see this is these data sets, these amazing data sets uh, um, recorded. Uh, 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 you know, these onshore, offshore uh, recordings uh, that were also done with some MCS in these long fjords in uh, western Canada and, and uh, southern Alaska, southeastern Alaska. So there was a number, there have been a number of surveys uh, there, uh, many of them, you know, a little more than 10 years ago. And uh, the, the S wave conversion and transmission at the bottom of a hard fjord. Uh, you know, with very little sediment at the bottom of the fjord, uh, is just amazing. So the the uh, for this deep crustal survey, the the S to S reflection section is actually much better than the P to P reflection section, which is the last thing you would expect in a uh, uh, in a deep crustal you know upper mantle survey reflection survey. Um, and then in the places where they they had a uh, uh, an interval of soft bottom. Okay, so you have a low velocity channel at the uh, at the at the surface, and then of course there's the water column too, but that's all you know. The soft material is pretty close to acoustic; it's got very little rigidity, and um, the water column, of course, is purely acoustic. And so the uh, um, the multiply ref reflected refractions off the the hard material below the soft bottom, okay. That will will start lining up and looking like surface waves, uh, and and you can see that in some surveys in the Great Basin too on land, in the alluvium, you know you're looking at P waves, uh, and and they're propagating faster than uh, than S waves, faster than Rayleigh waves. There's plenty of Rayleigh waves in those data sets too, being on land, but uh, they're still propagating uh, more slowly than the uh, uh, than the refraction, and you see the same kind of dispersion. So it's a surface wave-like phenomenon you can get even in the acoustic case, and you can actually see it on on, on you know certain data sets. Um, think of the uh, of the shingling that you've seen in the uh, um, uh, in in the Santa Medio data sets. Um, you know that's that's related. You know, so if you had like uh, lots of closely spaced shingles, then that really is is getting you a uh, a surface wave like uh, propagation, uh, and and so every every multiple reflection that's another, you know that's adding another uh, recursion on the Lippmann Schwinger equation, and so you get down to the end you know there and you've got you know like twenty or thirty terms on it, and and. Um, and and so you know you can estimate that, but you can also, you know, you can easily produce acoustic finite difference synthetics that uh, that will show those uh, those multiples as well. And then you know it's a, it's a purely acoustic phenomenon. And now we're going to move into. And now we're moving into elastic. We'll look at the waves. Yeah, but we you know, I'm not going to talk about that. Because uh, <laughs> um, I've always been curious. How you would model Rayleigh waves? It seems like it would be pretty hard. Uh, not really. So when we get into, um, I think I should have time later on to lecture about uh, 
um, these uh, deterministic uh, um, uh, finite difference uh, uh, wave modeling uh, codes. Um, you know, I'll, I'll show you just how easy it is to get service waves uh, with a finite difference run. Okay. Uh, but here's full wave. You know, this is full wave modeling, and and matching the surface waves is really with full wave inversion. That's part of the job. You know, and matching the 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 uh, the elastic uh, uh, waves, uh, including the surface waves, is part of the job, and becomes a, you know great constraints on the model. That's why this is uh, successful, uh, and uh, successfully absorbs uh, you know many uh, uh, years, um, you know giga uh, giga hours of uh, of computer time as well. Okay. So, so we're building a, uh, a very similar um, uh, asymptotic model. And uh, here's the equivalent sources. All right, and I've, I've got arrows here for the equivalent sources. This is still like the, uh, uh, this is out of one of my, uh, actually, Sergio Chavez Perez's papers. Um, and uh, uh, We've got the same axes, uh, you know. Um, this is the equivalent source for a, re, uh, a, a little nugget of reflectivity uh, that is at the center of each, uh, you know, radially uh, um, of each uh, um, uh, uh, radiation pattern here, you know. So. Uh, uh, and the, the incident wave is always coming straight down in these diagrams. And then, uh, you know, uh, 45 degree uh, theta, you know, which is the angle between the incident and the reflected wave. OK, 45 degrees would be off that way, or that way, or that way. Or, or you know, to the right as well. These are symmetric, OK, perfectly symmetric. Um, you know, 90 degrees is. Uh, uh, is off to the side, and forward scattering 180 degrees is is straight down. So a, uh, a delta, and, and then uh, Sergio uh, uh, wanted to plot the, uh, um, you know, what it is versus uh, uh, what it looks like versus offset. Okay, so um, and and really, you know, he meant uh, uh, you know theta, right? So the um, um, uh, again, a, uh, a delta rho over rho, an A1, as we're calling it now, uh, looks like a point force back towards the incident wave, back in the direction of the, uh, uh, in the opposite direction of the incident wave. Um, and it uh, declines as uh, cosine theta. Okay, So it's, uh, it's strongest. Uh, um, in uh, um, in in pure you know normal backscattering normal reflection, and it's zero at uh, ninety degrees, okay, and then uh, in forward scattering it becomes strong again, you know it reaches a peak at one hundred eighty degrees, uh, but it's negative, right? Because that's you know the source is uh, pointing away, the point force is pointing away from forward scattering. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the interesting thing about the delta lambda in the uh, uh, which is now a two, okay, in the elastic case, <clears throat> and we're following uh, uh, Wu and Aki here, um, who came up with this uh, asymptotic uh, approximation. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, no matter what direction, okay, the, the incident wave is still coming straight down onto the point. <clears throat> all right, and whatever direction, you know, straight back, normal reflection, ninety degree uh, reflection, straight forward, forward scattering, same amplitude, and it's always positive. Okay, so so the uh, the it's the delta lambda in the in the elastic formulation, and this is you know where where I started getting. You know, trying to figure out what the heck does lambda mean. You know, it, it fall, it's it's falls out of, of uh, you know a traditional way of deriving the wa the elastic wave equation. Um, 
but it's a kind of a mysterious quantity. Um, so uh, delta, uh, a delta lambda uh, reflector is, is the point explosion. Okay? It's, not, uh, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not delta k in the elastic case. Only in the acoustic case is delta k a point explosion. So this is the one that maybe is the most mysterious. You know, why, why isn't k still uh, a point explosion? No, it, you know, if you, of course, uh, by combining these, you can, you can look at what the delta k is, and it's not, it's not an explosion in the elastic case. All right, delta mu is a point double couple. No, I'm sorry, it's a point single couple. Okay, which kind of makes sense. You know, it's a it's a shear. Mu is the uh, shear modulus, and a delta mu is like a point shear, and so that's cosine squared, very much like uh, delta rho, but uh, squared. So it's uh, it falls a bit faster, and you can see it's not a in the polar plot. It's not a circle. It's uh, more of an ellipse. All right. So this really has uh, has nothing anywhere near. Uh, uh, 90 degrees, but reflects back uh, quite uh, still quite strongly on normal reflection and has strong forward scattering. Okay, so here's all the all the terms according to Wu and Aki in 1982. Uh, again, linear, right? Every all of these are linear related to a1, a2, uh, and or a3, right? Uh, the p to p. Notice notice something something very interesting here. The, the delta lambda and the a2, right, the a2, which depends on delta lambda, only appears in p to p reflection. In p to s, uh, these are reflection coefficients according to Wu and Aki's uh, asymptotic approximations, okay, uh, which assume that, that delta rho is much, much less than rho, delta lambda is much, much less than lambda, delta mu is much, much less than mu, okay. The the um, the p to s reflection coefficient, right, uh, depends on a one and a three, but not on a two, not on delta lambda. The s to p uh, reflection, you know, conversion coefficient, if you want, depends on a one, depends on a three. Again, doesn't depend on a two, and even the s to s, you know, strongly, of course, strongly depends on a three. Okay, doesn't depend on a two, so the delta lambda is 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 unique to our p to p reflection data. Okay, very interesting. <clears throat> of course, the p to p reflection data, you know, depends on everything a one, a two, and a three. Uh, you know, delta rho, delta lambda, and delta mu. Um, the other ones, uh, you know, they uh, they're they're hard to distinguish from each other. But maybe if we contrast a p to p reflection amplitude against any of the others, then we can figure out what the a two is, what the what the delta lambda is. So uh, uh, really, a very interesting uh, juxtaposition here, uh, and um, maybe a reason why you know we have any ability. You know, why in an elastic world can we could we ever Use an uh, an acoustic approximation. It's because of delta lambda, and its point explosion um, uh, effective uh, uh, source for a reflection. Okay, and the fact that that it only influences p to p reflection. That is why, in the real world, for so long, we've been able to ignore all the other. Uh, all the other, you know, even under this asymptotic single, you know, single uh, Feynman diagram, um, you know, single interaction types of uh, data, okay, which we'll call our, our elastic reflection data, you know, we, we can we can ignore these others and just concentrate on P to P. I mean, one big factor, of course, is that the P to P reflections arrive for, before any of these others, and so we can just make a simple time cut of our data. In, in many cases, and, and all we've got are P2P reflections. Uh, but it's also the fact that, uh, that the, uh, the delta lambda contributes and contributes so evenly to, um, to, the, uh, um, to the P2P reflection and not any of the others. 
Uh, kind of strange there. All right, so let's work out the whole system here. Here's the elastic wave equation, okay? Uh, L applied to uh, to you, and and uh, you know without a source, we're gonna leave, we're gonna forget, leave out the source term for the moment, okay? L applied. This is uh, uh, velocity. It's a it's a vector wave field of, of velocity. U um, V W, uh, you know. Are its components so uh, u is a vector here, and uh, uh, and u as a scalar would be the scalar field of x direction of uh, velocities, wave velocities, and uh, not wave velocities, particle motion velocities. V would be the uh, the y direction or the z direction particle motion velocities, and uh, and w. No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, v is the the, v, the y direction particle motion velocities and w are the z direction particle motion velocities. Okay, and here is uh, you know uh, writing out to more in the uh, the Born um, uh, the Born way under the Born approximation. Um, what uh, what this is? Okay, we've got rho omega squared i. I mean, really here this is a vector equation, so. Um, We've got to, uh, 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 and I think this is in, uh, yeah, this is in x and z, so there's no y here, okay. Um, so uh, if we were in three dimensions, uh, each of these uh, little uh, matrices would be three by three instead of two by two, and you can see they're just ways of organizing uh, our our equation here, so that this one equation can really represent. Um, four equations, okay. So we've got uh, no. I'm sorry, two equations. So we've got uh, dz uh, applied to a apply uh, applied to dz, which is, that is applied to the wave field u, right? Equal to zero. That's a wave equation. And here's uh, dz applied to b applied to dx, and here's dx applied to b transpose applied to dz. Here's dx applied to c applied to dx, uh, and the abcs here they don't really mean um, they don't mean the same things that we've been uh, you know talking about a uh, a b and b transpose uh, last time. That's it's this is a different b now. Sorry, um, and then there's a an identity matrix in there. Okay, a is uh, uh, these are medium parameter uh, matrices. Uh, a is uh, has got mu and lambda plus two mu along the diagonal. B has got a, uh, a zero diagonal and uh, lambda and mu on the off diagonal. Um, C has uh, got lambda plus two mu and mu along the diagonal. Um, and then uh, um, I, of course, is a two by two identity matrix. Okay, so uh, we can uh, rewrite this and. Uh, Ronald Labrosse uh, did that in his thesis, um, so it wasn't too much work for me. Um, L is uh, is a uh, del vector operator, uh, which is defined this way. Okay, this is all just for algebraic convenience, right? No, no big, uh, no big deal about changing the uh, the meaning of del here. Um, you know, it's got dx along the along the diagonal and and d, dz and minus dz off the diagonal. This uh, h um, has got zero along the diagonal and dx and dz along the uh, uh, off the diagonal. Okay, so we have um, uh, you know this is just taking all these vector these different equations and, and trying to rearrange them uh, in a compact amount of space. Um, and then uh, this gamma is lambda plus two mu. There's mu. Um, and uh, and here's mu's along here and mu's along there, um, so uh, uh, you know we got h uh, um, h uh, uh, and here we're, here we're just pulling out l right. We don't have the wave field anymore. Um, the the mu, I'm sorry, the u vector wave field. Uh, we're just pulling out the uh, the the really the, just the derivatives right. Um, and there's the omega part. Okay, rho omega squared i, and uh, just some things to note about this notation: uh, delta delta transpose delta is equal to 
Uh, it's it's uh, uh, commutative, as it turns out. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's not delta. That's uh, let's call it del. Uh, and then del del transpose. Okay, that's there. Those are equal, uh, and those are equal to uh, uh, dx squared plus dz squared applied to uh, to the identity matrix, just to you know split out the uh, um, the correct uh, equations. Um, you know, one equation here, one vector equation here, acting as a as a whole bunch of uh, of uh, um, as as a whole bunch of of uh, well two uh, scalar equations. Okay, for our two D case. Um, also, uh, uh, H transpose, and then this uh, acting on on this two by two thing, um, which is. Uh, it's not I transpose; it's something else. Um, uh, H is equal to H times this thing uh, applied to H transpose, and what is that? That's uh, dx does the cross uh, derivatives spatially dx dz uh, applied to uh, that uh, that matrix. Okay, so uh, you know this is what what allows us to. Write uh, uh, the the full vector wave equation for elastic uh, in two D in a fairly simple form, okay, and in three D it would be you know not terribly more complicated. All right, <clears throat> okay. So uh, uh, again, Born approximation implemented right here. Uh, G is approximated by G zero plus G zero uh, V G zero. G is now a matrix operator. Okay, G is still minus L, L inverse. Okay, V is uh, L minus L naught, right? L minus L zero. Okay, uh, G O satisfies the uh, G naught satisfies the Born approximation. Um, well, the Born approximation is that G G naught satisfies this. Okay, so um, uh, man, it's Kind of complicated to say. So rho naught uh, uh, omega squared g naught plus uh, del this special del we've uh, defined times uh, this uh, gamma mu zero um, uh, gamma naught mu naught um, uh, two by two uh, applied to uh, del transpose applied to g naught plus two h uh, applied to uh, this uh, this mu off diagonal. Uh, Matrix and uh, or two by two, and um, H applied to H transpose applied to G naught um, minus uh, two H transpose uh, with the mu off diagonal again applied to H G naught. Okay, so there's the uh, let's see, um, yeah, there's. Uh, uh, you know the the uh, um, uh, uh, you know we're still looking at the the now's the we're looking at the Born approximated wave equation right notice there's no G's in here only G naughts okay and here's our source term now introduced on the right hand side right so we have um, uh, you know the uh, the delay basically is still still the imaging condition in here, okay, and uh, and the source wavelet, okay. V is a scattering potential, and what is that, okay? So basically, we take, uh, uh, you know, this is basically L, right? And so we take L minus L naught, and so we get the scattering potential as, um, uh, you know, first the frequency part. Rho minus rho naught omega squared i plus del applied to you know and here's uh, again subtracting um, um, and um, gamma uh, minus gamma naught uh, and uh, mu minus mu naught on the diagonal applied to uh, uh, del transpose plus two h uh, applied to uh, the mu off diagonal two by two. Applied to H transpose, and then two H transpose applied to the again to the mu two by two applied to H. All right, and if we then define uh, 
uh, A1 is what we're used to, is is what we're now used to. Rho over rho naught minus one, or delta rho over rho. A2 is um, uh, gamma over gamma naught minus one, okay, or delta gamma over over gamma naught. So now A2 is a little more complicated than than before, right? It it involves uh, gamma. Where was gamma? Gamma is now lambda plus two mu. Okay. Uh, and A3 is uh, involving the rigidity, uh, mu over mu naught minus 1, or, or delta mu over mu. Okay. This forms the reflection data. Okay. So the reflection data is uh, the, uh, the source wavelet. Um, the F has to describe the source radiation pattern. Okay. So uh, it could be an earthquake. So F would be a, uh, a focal mechanism, um, or it would be the focal mechanism for a vibrator at, at the surface, which is uh, uh, not very simple. But um, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, cosine squared uh, for a vibrator at the surface. Um, but it depends on which uh, it's cosine squared for P waves going down and something else. You know, this F matrix also has to define. You know how different waves, uh, because of course each source has a radiation pattern that's different for different kinds of waves. So F has to incorporate all those. Then we got propagation to the uh, uh, and G naught of course uh, uh, you know defines both P and S wave propagation to the reflector, and the reflector reacts according to the uh, uh, the Wu and Aki uh, reflection coefficients here. Um, and the uh, apparent uh, sources, um, or the equivalent sources, um, and uh, that creates the uh, reflectivity potential. And then we carry that those waves, both as P and S waves, back to up to the receivers. Okay, in in uh, in, in here in, in uh, you know uh, as as vector uh, vector waves. Okay. Um, although this equation you could use in three dimensions as well. Okay. So then we can apply the WKBJ and the and the far field approximations just like we did before, and come up with elastic Born modeling. And let's say we focus just on the P to P, right? Uh, that's in a way the most interesting because it involves uh, rho lambda and mu. All right. So we have the P to P data. Um, and here is, is is written out in the omega domain. Okay, so e to the i omega. This is uh, you know a shift term for the imaging condition. You know it's it's uh, t one p plus t two p, right? From the uh, source to the reflector, from the reflector to the receiver, right? So it's just a shift term there. Um, and then we're summing over all. Uh, um, you know we got to sum here over all the volume. Okay. And we got to sum, sum uh, all the uh, uh, receivers and their uh, and their amplitude uh, factors. Okay, uh, you know source uh, uh, to reflector. Right, XS is the is the court is the location vector of the source. X vector here is the location vector of the reflect of the reflection of the reflecting point. So that's uh, source to reflector. And uh, this AP, this is for P waves, of course, uh, just geometric spreading for P waves, uh, is uh, from the reflector X to uh, the receiver X sub G. Okay, here's the uh, the uh, Wu and Aki uh, P wave reflection coefficient, which depends on theta. So that's uh, uh, where is that? That's this thing up here, right? It involves uh, a one cosine theta. Um, a two my uh, a two times minus one, okay, and um, <clears throat> and uh, and then uh, uh, beta squared over alpha squared. That's uh, beta is the uh, is the uh, in Wunaki's. This comes this notation comes from Wunaki's paper directly. So that's uh, the shear wave velocity divided by the P wave velocity. Beta squared divided by alpha squared are the are the is the Ratio of the of the shear velocity of the shear over uh, uh, 
over p velocity squared. Okay, uh, and then there's the a three, which is in there still linearly, but it's multiplied by sine squared of uh, of uh, theta. Okay, so there's that reflection coefficient. Okay, r sub p p depends on on uh, on theta, and we've got um, uh, omega squared over alpha squared or alpha to the third power. Get that. Um, that is a uh, again alpha is the uh, the p velocity, and um, and we have the uh, the p wave radiation pattern from the source depends on where the source is and where the reflector is, and so it's really just another amplitude factor, okay, um, and then uh, the source wavelet, and we're integrating over all the uh, all the possible reflecting points, honoring part of um, you know, we're honoring part of uh, Labrasse's, uh, I'm sorry, part of Feynman's uh, idea that you add up everything possible at all of its different likelihood. And so we're adding up over all the reflectors at all of their reflection coefficients. You know, the reflection coefficient is kind of our likelihood uh, if you cast this into Feynman uh, terms. Uh, and, and in Le Ronan's thesis, you can find. Uh, uh, and expre expressions for which are simpler, a little bit simpler actually, uh, for the, uh, uh, the the p to s conversion data, the s to p conversion data, and the s to s reflection data. Okay, the um, the amplitude uh, uh, factor for geometric spreading is just um, the uh, 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 the magnitude of the change in uh, and and this p here. That's our that's our old friend. The ray parameter, okay, and um, uh, and then divide by the uh, takeoff angle at, at the source. We'll call that theta naught, okay. Here's oh, it's written right here. The reflection coefficient according to Wu and Aki, uh, and you know um, Wu and Aki wrote down, and I wrote down above the uh, reflection coefficients for the other modes, um, and so. Um, we have uh, elastic uh, uh, reflection tomography. Okay, so the forward projection, the forward modeling is integrating over all reflectors. Okay, and uh, we have we, we now compose this thing as uh, as M, right? And it involves uh, uh, and then there's this column vector of uh, you know so the operator is uh, we'll call M. Okay, here what is M? M applied to the model C is uh, G naught V G naught F S. Okay, you know very much uh, uh, parallel to the acoustic case. Okay, uh, we just have to include that radiation pattern there, uh, and since we can you know radiate uh, uh, S waves as well as P waves. Uh, so we're adding up over the over the model, summing over all the model, and the uh, and and M is acting on on C, and so M depends on uh, a one, a two, a three. But notice, still it's still linear, right? There's three equations here, right? We got uh, two pieces of uh, data. We've got a U seismogram and a V seismogram. Okay, those are the uh, the scalar components of the uh, U vector. The uh, uh, the uh, uh, elastic uh, um, uh, particle motion uh, uh, velocity. Okay. Um, right. So the a one, a two, a three, they all depend on where the reflex reflection is, the x and z. Okay. So then m operates on that, and then we we integrate over uh, dx and dz. Now using exactly the same trick as for the acoustic, right? Basically integrating everything else together. Okay, and integrating over the data as well as the uh, the volume, and then finding the m transpose by basically pulling out uh, the integration over just the data. Right, that gets you an estimate of you know here in this column vector we've got an a one section in x and z, an a two section in x and z, and an a three section in x and z. Okay, and so that's an integration. Uh, um, you know, through this uh, M transpose um, of uh, the U and V data, 
And that, uh, that M involves uh, just the same things that uh, you saw in the acoustic, you know, multiplying by, uh, uh, you know, multiplying the, uh, 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 by 1, multiplying by cosine theta, multiplying by uh, sine theta, sine squared theta, excuse me, you know, when we're getting the different uh, uh, parameters. Not ever dividing by them, and not ever dividing by the uh, the uh, amplitude, uh, uh, <clears throat> the geometric spreading factors either. Always multiplying by these things. Okay, uh, and we're integrating over all the data. And what is that integration? Just as you know, that it would be a uh, <clears throat> that would be a uh, um, a pre-stack Kirchhoff migration. Okay. But keeping track of these different amplitude factors, keeping track of uh, theta, okay, and uh, and we get three sections out: a one, a two, and a three sections. All right. Um, so it's just a, a series of three migrations here, um, and uh, and just keeping track of the right factors, okay. And, and you might think, all right, so great. That's a that's a beautifully simple uh, in. You know, back projection. Okay. You know, we got we started with forward projection, and we know all the uh, all the simplifications that go into that. Now we've back projected this puppy. There's even more. Uh, you know, we got the back projection, uh, uh, the tomographic approximation on top of everything else. Okay. You know, we're not inverting. We're we're just taking the uh, um, we're just taking the the kind of the first term of the inversion, which is the back projection. Okay. Does this have anything to do with reality? And so uh, Ronan found uh, a uh, uh, a couple of um, uh, VSP data sets, um, and uh, uh, you know that you know the vertical sizing profiles provide the full range. You know, service survey you're you're limited. You know, you're lucky if you can get theta out to forty five degrees. Okay, with a um, with a VSP, where you got a a source at the surface, and you've got uh, uh, you know reflectors all through here. This this whole thing is a reflected reflecting volume in this cross section. Okay, and uh, you know there are uh, uh, seismometers have been placed at every all these levels in both of these wells. Okay, and sources have been put uh, at these three points. So you can see that depending on what reflector you're looking at, you know, or, or what receiver you're looking at, you could be looking at the same reflector at you know near normal incidence. Say the reflector is uh, is over here, you know, you got near normal incidence into these receivers here, and you got near forward scattering to the to the receivers down deeper in the wells. So you get a good range, you know, that's what Ronan was looking for to test this, a good range of, of theta being sampled. Right, that's really the critical step here. Okay, here's the uh, the entire data, which is mostly you know down going direct wave. This is a uh, a VSP record, so you see the VSP first arrival. Um, depth is increasing to the uh, up here. Strangely enough, sorry about that. Okay, and uh, as with all good industrial data sets, uh, depth is, depth is in feet. Okay, and so then. Um, uh, he applied a little uh, a dip filter, okay, not the Hale dip filter, but a different one. Uh, I think it was an FK dip filter, and he just separated out the upgoing wave field, which you might be able to see uh, a little bit of uh, right there from a reflector that's just below the bottom of the well, okay. And that's generating an upgoing wave, and there's also these other reflections, which are uh, generating upgoing waves, okay. So that's the uh, the upgoing waves are the P to P uh, data set, all right? And yes, indeed, because he he looked at no downgoing waves, he did he did limit his um, uh, you know he had to remove the uh, the downgoing direct wave because that's not included in our in our linear model, okay? Um, <clears throat> And and but by restricting himself to upgoing waves, he he did, you know, cut short the uh, uh, 
the uh, the the different uh, uh, thetas that he could that he could analyze. You know, he removed the whole you know ninety degree to one hundred eighty degree thetas, all of those thetas, by just looking at upgoing waves with this dip filter data set. Um, you know, but he did a very good job uh, uh, filtering the uh, dip filtering the data set. Okay, so here's kind of the situation. Um, you know, we got these three sources, and he reconstructs this uh, um, this section. And uh, this is uh, a reconstruction for P wave impedance. So, you know, this would be uh, some combination of, of rho, lambda, and mu, <coughs> right? And so this is like our P to P uh, reflectivity. <coughs> and uh, it's very it's strongest on the backscattering. And of course, the strongest thing that comes out here is this reflector that's down below the, uh, uh, the two wells. Um, but there's other intervals here that are that are reflecting, like this uh, interval that you can see in the uh, in the in the sonic logs. Uh, well, actually, well, yeah, in one well in the uh, in the uh, sonic log stronger than the density, and in the other well, the uh, density log stronger than the sonic. Um, so, uh, and he also produced uh, uh, the uh, Mm, I should have put that in there too. He produced the, uh, uh, you know, the 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 separated rho, lambda, and mu uh, sections. Uh, it's not great, and I think part of it is uh, because of the restriction here of the, uh, you know, there wasn't great separation of uh, of rho from lambda from mu because the separation is best if you really get out to ninety degrees. But here, by by inverting just the uh, uh, the upgoing waves, he was really, in most cases, restricting his uh, his land his thetas to really uh, forty five degrees or less. You know, not even getting out to ninety degrees. You got to get out to ninety degrees to be able to distinguish the uh, uh, the the lambda the lambdas from the mu's, right? Because the 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 rows and the mu's uh, have no reflectivity at ninety degrees. And the uh, and the lambda does. Um, uh, let me just go back up to that. Uh, um, back up to that crucial diagram. Right. So if you want to distinguish effectively between uh, uh, density reflectivity, lambda reflectivity, and mu reflectivity. Um, then, uh, and for instance, uh, uh, when you have uh, gas, right, you'd expect there to be uh, a lot of rho reflectivity. Um, when you have uh, hard layers that are producing uh, um, very, uh, 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 very um, uh, high amplitude reflections, and at the bottom of hard layers, you'll get high amplitude reflections as well, and they'll be inverted in phase. Um, okay, that that can look like gas, uh, but you can see that uh, those hard layers uh, will will produce lots of, uh, you know, they're high in delta lambda, so they'll uh, they'll produce lots of reflectivity at ninety degrees, whereas a true uh, gas reflector. Would produce zero reflect reflectivity at ninety degrees. Okay, a true uh, uh, row reflector. All right. Um, if you're trying to see uh, uh, um, kind of uh, bubbly shales versus uh, uh, fractured shales, okay, uh, the fractured shales will have uh, a lot of reflectivity in in mu in delta mu, and and Less reflectivity in delta lambda, but a, a high porosity um, uh, yet competent shale will have uh, a lot of reflectivity in delta lambda, uh, and we'll discuss the kinds of porosity that produce uh, the different uh, kinds of reflections, and less uh, reflectivity in uh, in delta mu. But again, you got to get out to ninety degrees. Okay, so this brings me next time. 
to discuss um, my experiments using um, using uh, um, uh, seismic sources that are earthquakes down even uh, uh, below a uh, slab interface, okay, which con contains lots of reflectivity. Okay, so I illuminated a slab interface uh, from above to get the uh, the angles that are uh, the incidence the the thetas that are less than ninety degrees, and I also illuminated I also illuminated the slab interface from earthquakes that were below it. Okay, to get the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the thetas that are at greater than ninety degrees. Okay, and um, so by surrounding the reflector I was interested in with, uh, with sources, which was easy to do in this case of an earthquake sequence of, uh, with earthquakes above and below at Weber, North Island, New Zealand, on the Hikarangi subduction zone, um, that, uh, um, that gave me more information about the, uh, uh, the nature of, uh, of the uh, uh, the porosity of the slab interface. So that's going to be uh, Wednesday's Wednesday's lecture. So find that uh, uh, there's a PowerPoint I think rendered into uh, um, into HTML uh, on the class website.